Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, I have been listening to the How to Fail at Flirting audiobook all day, which is maybe a little self-centered, but it's great. Uh, so I'm going to do my best impression of January Lavoie and read a little passage for you. Do something embarrassing. Here goes nothing. He reached for my hand, lacing his fingers with mine, and we walked together toward the crowd where the music blared from large speakers, the percussion and horns building a palpable energy around us. Jake gripped my hand tighter as we ducked through the throng of bodies. On stage, a man with a microphone instructed the crowd. Near us, a middle-aged couple in matching blue t-shirts and jean shorts held each other close, and two women in their 70s juggling brightly colored cocktails and pretzels ignored the instructions and made up their own steps. The voice boomed from the stage. Okay, let's get going now that we've learned the basics. We missed the beginning already, I said into Jake's ear. He shrugged. We'll catch up. Jake, I hissed again, a touch of panic rising in me, not knowing what would come next. I looked at the couples near us to see their movements, trying to memorize how they moved to the loud beat. We'll be fine, Jake encouraged as he slid his arm around me, his palm resting against a shoulder blade. Just follow my lead. I'll step forward, you'll step back, and then the other way. His lips grazed the top of my ear and I willed him to trail down my neck again to that spot that had made me shudder in anticipation the night before. From the stage, the voice boomed through the microphone and one, two, three, around us the crowd undulated like a wave. Jake pushed toward me, gently stepping forward with one foot, but I was focused on what the woman next to me was doing and I didn't move in time, so his body collided with mine. He chuckled and spread his fingers across my back, which felt amazing, and I got distracted and stepped with the wrong foot the next time, bumping into his chest. My gracelessness knew no bounds. How does everyone else know how to do this? I growled at myself, heffing out a heavy breath and pausing my movements to catch up to the beat. All I had to do was step forward and back, right? I have a flipping PhD. I can figure this out. You're doing great, he encouraged, squeezing my hand. You're a bad liar, I returned over the music, taking a successful step forward, but then second guessing myself on the next beat and stepping on his foot. It's literally counting to three and knowing left from right. Here, Jake said, pulling me flesh against him, our thighs touching, chests against each other. Sandalwood and soap filled my nostrils and my frustration about dancing ebbed into more memories from the night before. I'll push my leg against yours and we'll step together, okay? He nudged my left leg with his right on the beat and our hips twisted in unison, then back, and I followed his movements, relishing the roll of his body against mine as we moved to the music. The crowd fell away. There was only the beat and him. I stopped worrying about the steps and followed his lead. A minute passed, the music swirling around us, our bodies still flush. Don't overthink it. Jake spoke near my ear, his hot breath stroking my skin, and I stifled a sigh, a tingle zipping through me. Trust me, okay? He has no idea what he's asking. I've never been a good dancer, but I had been an eager dancer for most of my life. Not knowing the steps and being hopelessly without rhythm had never stopped me from getting on the dance floor. That was until Davis told me I was embarrassing him. By the time he stopped telling me and started showing his disappointment or anger, I'd long since stopped dancing. One, two, three, the man on stage counted, and he and his partner demonstrated some kind of complicated spin as we rocked back and forth. He said something about the left foot, or was it the right? Crap, I'd missed a few key details. I was comfortable with the step we'd been doing. That was my dancing sweet spot, and I worried if I broke the rhythm, it would never come back. Five, six, seven, the instructor counted from the, counted the beats from the stage. Did he say step on four or five? Jake squeezed my hand and raised his arm with a reassuring grin, nudging me to a spin. The slick soles of my sandals helped my movement, and I twirled, clutching his hand, the breeze in motion catching the light fabric of my top. I spun once, then twice, the crowd and the lights on the stage a blur. I wasn't graceful and the spin stopped abruptly when I tripped into Jake, steadying myself against him, but I laughed into his chest. I told you I was no good. I'm having fun. He guided me back to the beat and we moved together. Plus, it gives me an excuse to touch you. I glanced up to meet his eyes. Were you looking for one? His hips rolled with mine and a heavy breath escaped my lips as he cupped the back of my neck. Hoping for one. The pressure and rhythm of our bodies in the middle of this crowd, the music blasting all around us, it was too much. We'd been laughing and teasing, but all that seemed to fade into the heat of the moment as our steps slowed. His gaze was intent on mine like he was seeing something rare and cataloging it in every detail. No one has ever looked at me like this. He lowered his chin and I closed my eyes in anticipation of his soft but unyielding kisses. I opened my eyes suddenly when the music changed and the surrounding crowd surged at a popular tune, all jostling us. 
New people moved closer to the stage and the already crowded dance floor was instantly packed. I glanced left and right, panicked at the sudden influx. Jake must have read my expression because he took my hand. Come on, I've got an idea. You'll like this better. Oh my God, I love this book, Denise. I love it so much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for that reading. Uh, I My cat might pop in and out. Uh, some people may have already seen her over here a little bit, but you know, she- My four-year-old might, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell me first, before we get into the book itself, tell me when did you first start reading romances and when did you start thinking, I can write this, I can do this too? Yeah, they're actually really different timelines. Um, I've always loved love stories. If I think back to even the Disney movies I loved as a little kid, it was the love story. It was the happily ever after. That was always my favorite part. And then when I was about 11 or 12, I consumed a whole lot of Danielle Steele, probably far too early to be reading that. Uh, but then I, I wasn't an active romance reader for a long time. I read a, a lot of things. I was really into horror and thrillers all through kind of high school and college. And then uh, once I got into graduate school, I didn't get to read anything um, that wasn't related to my kind of academic writing. So I really didn't come back to romance until I was finishing up my PhD, um, maybe six or seven years ago. And I started commuting and listening to audiobooks. I'm a big fan of audiobooks. And the first ones I found were romance. I think I took in Mariana Zapata's entire collection of romance novels. I just devoured them, Lauren Blakely, and then all of these different authors that I could just find and listen to and then started reading. And at a certain point I thought, you know, I wonder if I could write that. But I didn't really take that seriously for myself until my son was born and I felt kind of lost. I was lost in sort of momming and work. And I felt like I, I didn't have that creative piece of myself anymore. And so I sat down to start writing and that's when I thought, you know, I, I think I can tell this love story. I love reading these, I love reading romance. I'm gonna try my hand at a light fluffy rom-com. Didn't get there. Uh, this has a lot of other kind of social issues in it. Um, but yeah, that was kind of how I came to the writing piece. So how did you come up with the idea for how to fail at flirting once you actually sat down and realized, yes, I'm about to do this? Uh, it started out as a kind of fun exploration of ex-boyfriends and the impact they have on us. And some of that is definitely still in there. Um, and um, Aaron, the best friend, one of the best friend characters who's kind of comedic relief and a good kind of angel on Naya's shoulder actually started out as a kind of funny dating fail that I have from college. Um, and so that's kind of where that idea came from. But once I started writing, I knew that my heroine would be a professor. Um, at the time and still, there's so much vitriol around what universities do and what professors do um, and who they are. And so I really wanted to show a very human version of a professor um, and particularly a professor who's a woman of color um, because those aren't stories that we often hear when we think about universities. And so that's kind of how the story started. This is my debut novel published. It's actually the first novel I ever wrote aside from one half formed NaNoWriMo book that will never see the light of day from 2007. Uh, so I rewrote large chunks of this. I learned a lot about writing along the way. Um, and then the story kind of came together in some different ways. Okay, um, we're gonna come back to the NaNoWriMo okay. <laughs> <laughs> failed draft, but I wanted to know what are, since you are you know such a fan of romance novels yourself, what are some of your favorite tropes and which ones did you include in How to Fail? Oh, so maybe not surprising because of my bio, my very favorite catnip trope is enemies to lovers. Um, if the, the couple hate each other at the beginning, like with a ferocity, I'm there for it. I love enemies to lovers. Um, that wasn't in this book. Obviously the hero and heroine meet um, and kind of fall for each other. It's a failed kind of one night stand, which I also like those. Um, but yeah, Enemies to Lovers is, is one of my very favorites. I'm working on something that's that right now. Um, but I, and I really want them to hate each other at the beginning. I don't know what that says about me, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but leave those simple miscommunications at home. I want like genuine um, antagonism. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is the easy chemistry between Jake and Naya is instant and it's so beautiful and charming and I was reading it and I I mean just as soon as they met and started like vibing I stopped and I texted my friend Bim and I was like I'm reading this advanced copy of this book put it on your wish list because you need this this is like 
everything that I would want to happen in real life. They were just, it was just a beautiful like connection that was instant, but also very thoughtful throughout um, because they do have this failed one night stand situation. And one of the, one of the, one of my favorite tropes that you include with the uh, failed one night stand is also, oops, this person is also important in my career somehow. (laughs) (laughs) So can you talk to me a little bit about that choice and why you wanted to add that layer um, into the, the complications between this failed one night stand? Yeah, I always say the book goes through Naya kind of flirting with professional ruin. Um, So Naya is uh, by choice, by personality and by circumstance, kind of a workaholic. Um, Her job is where she finds purpose. It's where she's found home. It's where she's found kind of everything. And I would say at least at the beginning of the book, her job is the most important thing in her life, save maybe her best friends. Uh, And so if something is going to really challenge her, it's going to be around her job. And I knew that going in, that is um, in large part how my life has been for, for a lot of my life and for a lot of folks that I know, um, where you know their job is their passion, they really love their work. And so I was thinking of, you know, I want, Jake needs to have some complications for her. He can't just be a hot nerd that is good in bed. I mean, he's that too, but um, you know, what would be this real complication? And so um, him being a challenge to her work would be one of the few things that would cause her true kind of internal cognitive dissonance, internal conflict. And so I kind of knew that from the beginning and narrowed down like what his actual role would be. Uh, But I knew from that character, the thing that would really cause her conflict would be if being with him was a challenge to where she kind of felt safe, which is in her workplace. Yeah, reading this, it was like watching a friend realize that the crush she had on someone was mutual, right? And just like all these different feelings of excitement to see Naya, I don't want to say come out of her shell, um, but kind of to see her learn to explore life outside of work a little bit more. And Naya has, um, both of them actually, have kind of dangerous manipulative exes um, that cause again another level of conflict but it's also very realistic um and so i wanted to ask you um how did you choose or why did you choose to give them that type of baggage to overcome not just the professional stuff between them but also in their personal lives away from each other they have these really heavy bags that they have to like figure out how to leave behind yeah and and i know I love writing horrible people (laughs) or like challenging people. Um, Again, don't know what that says about me, but I really had fun writing both of their exes. I mean, fun is probably the wrong word for writing the horrible male antagonist, but um, I really kind of enjoyed crafting those people, but I tried to think about what each of them would kind of bring to the relationship that would maybe hold them back a little bit. Um, and so for the, the heroine um, is, is a survivor of domestic violence and her ex was her abuser. And so he is, is a gaslighter. He is manipulative and he is kind of a lot of different things that we see, don't always see depicted in people who are abusive. And some of it's that emotional relationship abuse. Um, and while Um, Jake's ex is not that I think he would come in with some trepidation and you mentioned sort of that they have this instant connection and I never actually thought of it as insta love but it is but it's almost because for the two of them it's the first time they've really been in love like they're having this very teenage reaction to falling in love but a teenage reaction from people in their 30s Um, and so like that chemistry is there but they both come into it with a little bit of caution Um, uh, Jake's ex, Gretchen, I loved writing her. I actually have a book in mind for her um, because I love the idea that, you know, you are always the hero in your own story or the heroine in your own story. And um, I kind of love that Jake acknowledges this is why it didn't work out, but this is probably what my culpability in that is. It wasn't just that she's not great, but you know, it, it wasn't just that she's horrible and you're wonderful. It was, you know, that I need to change something and how I, um, approach relationships. And so I kind of wanted him to have a little bit of that growing too. You talked about your love of uh, horror and thriller um, before you kind of fully rested on romance. And I can kind of see that with Davis, um, Naya's ex, because he is such a menacing character. Like 
every time he is on the page, I'm just like, oh, he's going to do something awful. I hate him. Why doesn't he die? <laughs> <laughs> so did that come into play? Did your, your thriller and horror background kind of come into play when you were like sketching him out? You know, I don't know. I, um, I kind of did some diff different research and part of some of my training that I've had just on working with people like that's some of the things I pulled from it wasn't based on any one kind of real person. Um, but you know, maybe I think more just from lifetime of reading thrillers or horror or watching yeah. scandal or t different TV shows is is some of where that came in and then, you know, again, just those touches of how does somebody act when they're cocky and they're getting away with this and they're in a you know highly respected position what are some of those power dynamics that come into play that somebody might feed on and so he's very much you know the jovial front man when other people are around and has sort of these asides um but I hadn't thought about that but it could be he also kind of took shape over time and I don't have a story for him. He can definitely go get hit by a bus once the book ends. <laughs> yeah, I, <just laughs> I would found, be fine with that. Yeah, I found his presence um, such a shadow, but in a good way, not in a way that made me want to like stop reading, obviously, but such in, um, again, it's just like this texture to the romance that I found really refreshing. Um, I thought you handled his character very well. I thought you handled uh, the confrontation um, course I'm not going to spoil that but I thought you handled the confrontation very well because again it was like this perfect thing for me to see uh, Jake be this guy who is kind of coming to the rescue but also Naya is rescuing herself I thought that was very well balanced so thank you for that that was just great um, thank you <laughs> in your acknowledgments you tease um you, you drop a little tease about how you forgot to take out the sex scenes before you gave <laughs> the draft to your parents. <laughs> and I want to, before we get into the like actual sex scenes of the books, I want to know like, how are you feeling about the, the fact that maybe uh, some of your students or your former colleagues or whatever might read this and realize, oh, Professor Denise is kind of spicy. Like, I mean, <laughs> Well, I will say um, my dad was texting me earlier as he listened to the audiobook, and my mom said he'd only cringed twice um, by about the halfway point. So I thought that that was good. Uh, you know, I thought that would be the weirdest part, um, but I also kind of along the way, and I'll back up a little bit and then come back into the sex scenes, is with writing romance I and reading romance even, I kind of used to keep that hidden. Um, I tell the story, I had a copy of The Goldfinch uh, that I downloaded and I think I had the audiobook too. And when somebody would like have my phone or, you know, be near my Kindle or in my car, I would switch over and be like, oh, I just started reading The Goldfinch. I've never read The Goldfinch. Uh, but that would be hiding whatever um, contemporary or erotic romance or whatever I was reading. Cause I just had this idea that I think so many people have that, you know, that's not smart reading or whatever that is. Um, and for me as, a, as an author and as a reader, so, something I've really loved about this journey is I don't put the goldfinch on anymore. I think I deleted it. I'm probably never going to read it. Um, <laughs> but I talk about it and I talk about the romance I'm reading and the romance I'm writing. And when somebody asks me, I no longer quietly say, it's a romance. And then even quieter, it's kind of steamy. Um, that, you know, I say that at, at the normal volume that I would and like screaming it. But um, to be proud of that and own it, particularly because it's stories that, you know, traditionally center women and people in marginalized identities that aren't centered in other spaces. And so that I've been really excited about. And also just thinking about how do we normalize relationships and love and sex and all of these things. And so um, I, know, I know some of my students are reading it because um, some of them have told me that they're reading it. Um, and that's fine. I also won't see them for two months because of winter break. So I get a little respite there. Um, and I know my dad read it earlier. So at that point, I'm kind of just like, yeah, you know, let's normalize this. And I won't really think about my great aunt reading it. That's the only one that's a little off-putting. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. I thought that would be the weird part and I really feel okay about it. Oh, that's good. Um, okay, so let's get into these sex scenes. Okay. Now, the sex scenes aren't just like steamy in the bedroom, in the hotel or whatever. They're kind of like throughout the day, they're texting each other, they're sending each other little cutesy, you know, notes or whatever. Um, can you talk to me about like making sure that sex is 
like an all day affair and that they're, you know, warming each other up. They're building this anticipation between each other. Yeah. Um, I love writing the text because I feel like that's so now it's not so now for me. I've been married for a while, so I haven't dated anyone in a while, but you know, you, you text and getting a text from somebody you like, and you're into like, it's just exciting in its own, right? It's that little communication. Um, and for, them, especially when they're in this place of pretending that it's just physical, that keeps that, that sensation going. But I think it's also that they just want to talk to each other. They just kind of, they want to flirt with each other. And so they have that instant chemistry, even though she especially is saying, okay, this is just a guy I'm hooking up with for a couple of days and it doesn't matter. Um, I think that shows in part how they really can't stay away from each other, which I think is so exciting when you're in that new relationship that there's just always these things going back and forth. Um, also that for, for Naya, she has not really had satisfying, uh, a satisfying sex life up to this point. And that is partly being with the abusive ex, but in a broader sense, not asking for what she wants, um, not demanding kind of what she wants and just kind of accepting. And so part of the kind of her metaphor is I'm turning my volume up. And part of that is kind of owning different things she, she wants from sex and finding this partner who's pretty good at it. Um, and so the sex scenes for her are not kind of just pleasure, but they're for her kind of eye-opening and trust building um, and also kind of believing in herself. I, I like to think they are. Uh, and so the texting is sort of part of that and making sure that he's connected to kind of that romance. And maybe I just like writing texting scenes because that's a lot in my second book as well. <laughs> I like, um, I like that they have these dad jokes that they share and the puns <laughs> that they share and they have this really, um, you know, they're really corny and cute with each other. And I just thought that was just so sweet. I love that so much. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just like, I'm thinking about it. So I told my friend, um, Bim, she was like, should I get the physical copy or should I get the Kindle? And I said, no, you need a physical copy because this is gonna be the kind of book that you're gonna read on your back in bed, like with it above your head because they're so darling. I love them Thank so you. much. The dad jokes were a lot of fun to go find and put together. <laughs> <laughs> um let's talk about process now okay okay because you are a working mother and spouse and how did you find time to write like how did you get from the idea to today your publication date yeah um I have been blessed with a child who sleeps so he was a baby when this started and he still sleeps pretty well um so I really don't write until he goes to bed um, and then my husband kind of loves it because we can hang out, sit together in the living room and he can put on the horrible television show that I don't care about watching or Star Wars. Cause I'll admit Jake has never seen Star Wars. That's me. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, we'll kind of hang out and then I can write from there. This writing has really helped me to be a little better about managing my time though. Um, and not even just managing my time, but kind of owning my time. I used to be somebody who sat at their desk and worked through lunch most of the time. And now I actually, I take my lunch break. That's when I do writing or editing or re reading or reviewing or whatever it is I need to be doing. Um, and so that's kind of been more, I've been able to kind of keep my time that way. At least for right now, writing to me very much still feels like an escape, not a hobby because I'm doing it professionally, but it feels like a hobby. It feels like something that's fun to do, to sit down and shut the rest of the world out and, and get in the life of these characters. And so um, in that way, it's, it's really easy that, you know, those are my, that's kind of my night and weekend activity um, for now. Um, and during the pandemic, my job has been a bit less demanding because I work at a university and we were um, at home and away from the students for so long. And so that was a little bit easier to kind of balance that too. So with, um, with that, do you want to make writing your full-time career? Would you like to get to that point where you're just like, you know what, I'm going to close my office door to my students forever now, and this is just going to be it? I mean, is my boss on here? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for me, that sounds really exciting. I don't think I'm quite ready to make that jump. I'm kind of like Naya, I'm sort of cautious in that way. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, that would be exciting. I love my 
work with college students. I work specifically with students of color, um, a lot of our first generation students. And I've done that for about 15 years, making sure they have what they need to be successful in college. And so that's rewarding in so many ways. Um, and I get to make graphs and work with data, which I also love because I'm a geek. Um, but, you know, living in this kind of different world and producing and creating just uses such a different part of my brain that it's, it's a fun fantasy right now to think about doing that full time. Do you apply? Do you apply that geek mindset to your writing? Like, are, do you outline? Do you have worksheets <laughs> that you apply to uh, how you sketch out your characters? Well, I know I should, <laughs> and then <laughs> I'll plot about sixty percent of the book, and then get bored and start writing it. And I'll write about 70% of it and then realize I don't know where it's going and then go back and work on it. Um, if my editor's on, she could probably guess that. Uh, so I, I always call myself a, a plotster or a plantster. Um, so I kind of I know the plotting and I know the process, but then I also just fall in love with, oh, well, what if they go dancing and I'm gonna write that scene? Or what if they do karaoke? That's a cut scene from the book is them kind of doing karaoke together. and. Um, then I, I kind of just jump in. So I'm somewhere in the middle, uh, which if I think about it, when I do some of my academic work, I do the same thing. Um, so there's a student that Naya has and she kind of, I don't want to say she gives up on him, but I think, you know, she's experiencing a certain type of academic burnout and stress about her job. And then he is also just kind of like, I don't know what I should be doing. Um, but they kind of, dance around each other with, when, when they're trying to figure out how can I help you and how can you help me or whatever. Um, um, but it turns out that like they just need to lower their expectations of each other and figure figure out their different paths um, together, which kind of mirrors Naya and Jake's relationship as I well. Know. Like, I mean, it's just kind of like uh, I have this idea of what it should be, but actually it's going to be like this. So I'm wondering... Um, in your own life, if you've ever had that experience of the professional setting, something happens there and you're kind of like, oh, huh, maybe I should do this in my personal life and see how it works out. Oh gosh. Um, I don't know that I, I don't know that I have um, kind of in that direct, well, I guess I think about it in the other direction I feel like I've learned some things in writing that I've brought into my day job, my mm -hmm. other professional life. Um, and I, I like review um, academic journal articles, which if I think about writing a romance novel and writing an academic journal article, they're about 7 million miles apart. Uh, but I do think um, the things I've learned about writing and reviewing and critiquing from being a fiction writer and reader, I, I think has made me a more effective reviewer when I'm looking at, you know, statistical analysis of student engagement and things along those lines. Um, and so in that way, I think I've kind of taken some of those skills I've gained from romance um, and brought that into my world that I think has made me a bit more empathetic. Um, if, if folks have ever taken the strengths finder assessment, it gives you like your top 34 strengths in order. Uh, empathy is my like number 33 out of 34. <laughs> I can use it. I can do it. It is not where I gain strength and power. Um, and so I do think that, um, you know, going through this and learning some things from people um, has made me more empathetic kind of in my reviewing. Okay, that's really interesting because again, their chemistry is so like instant and um, the way that you flesh out all of the characters um, is so so well done that I'm surprised to hear you say that you wouldn't necessarily consider yourself very empathetic. But um, <laughs> um, <Thank> I, you. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, do you have any like celebrity stand-ins in your mind when you're sketching out these characters? Um, like, and who would be your dream cast if this were to become a movie? Uh, yeah, so in my, it's interesting when I write, I don't describe my characters a lot. They kind of, I mean, I just spent some time on Jake's abs, but other than that, um, I, I keep it pretty broad. And I think because I'm a reader, I like to put my own kind of faces in there. But uh, in my head as I was writing, Jake um, looked like Henry Cavill. So if Henry's on, give me a call, let me know. Uh, that's how I pictured. And Naya, I, I pictured a lot of different people um, as Naya. Initially it was Meghan Markle. She's got a couple other things going on right now. Um, but that's kind of who I pictured when I was writing the character. Um, I think, um, um, oh, I'm forgetting her name from Lovecraft Country, but it'll come to me. Um, 
but I can oh. picture her as well. Um, uh, Jornay Smollett? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. So yeah, that's in my head kind of who I've cast, but I definitely realized um, when they were doing the cover, especially for the UK edition where you see the characters' faces, they asked me some questions. I was like, well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know exactly what they look like. Um, so I had to think about it, but that's in my head kind of who I had pictured. And okay, I wanna go back to that failed NaNoWriMo yes. uh, manuscript. <laughs> now that you have the experience of writing this uh, debut novel and you you said you're writing your second one, do you think you're gonna go back to that? Like, you, you know, like, of course you're gonna say, oh, it's awful, but you have experience now, you know it's possible to take something, take this, you know, lump of clay and make it into something fantastic. Are you gonna go back and revisit and see what you can pull from that? I don't think so. Um, it wasn't romance and I did love the story and I do love the story. It's it's about adult children who are coming home because their, their mom has died suddenly. Um, and then as they kind of go through the preparations, you see how they interact now and then you flash back to their childhood and kind of learn how it was. And I, I sort of love the story about family dynamics, but I would have to start from the ground on this. I think I changed their names, like all of their names about three times while writing. <laughs> so I, I didn't go back and change it. So you just suddenly go from being called Carmen to being called Melissa and somebody will figure it out. There's like a mystery that I introduced like at 30,000 words that I never resolve. It just hangs there about the mom and a Vietnam veteran who she was in love with. Like It's a mess. Uh, but that was the first time I ever tried to write it. And I did write 50,000 words in a month. Um, and that was kind of a stopping point. It was before I started my PhD, but I was between graduate programs. And so it was kind of coming back to fiction and back to writing and getting to realize that I could do it, which I think is the coolest thing about NaNoWriMo is you write 50,000 words in a month and they might not be good, but you wrote them like you did that. Yeah. That said, these were not good words. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the family down, the family upstairs, I don't even remember the name of it. Uh, the family downstairs is, is probably going to see the light of day. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we get to the q and I want to ask you one last thing about Naya and Jake. What is your favorite scene with the two of them from the book? Oh, there are so many, but the one, um, the one I'll probably talk about is have a reason to talk about it, I guess, um, is uh, they have kind of, they had their first hookup, they get back together, um, and she had shared with him, you know, I love my name, but I always wished I could find pencils with my name on it, because um, Naya isn't as common, and I had that experience growing up. Denise is a name peaked in like 1964, uh, so there were never <laughs> pencils, and um, that's just kind of a, a silly moment, but I love it, and I've written about this a couple times because she feels seen that he remembered this small thing she said and he gives her pencils with her name on it um, as this little gift and he is very like open it open it open like very kind of excited and I think it kind of distills their two personalities down into this one sort of small moment yeah um that that scene resonated with me as well because Nicole with an H is not going to be found on any keychain or pencil or anything out well, there. Well, I have so. to tell you as a thank you, you probably can't see these very well, but I got some of these made for you. So I'll get your address later. <laughs> so thank you for joining me tonight. <laughs> thank you. I was like, you know what? Who is on my team who doesn't have a common name? Because we all deserve <laughs> pencils. <laughs> yes, I love that. Uh, okay, so let's get into some of these questions here. Um, let's see. Christina asks, what's your advice to people looking to establish a career in the field of their true profession? Um, you know, I think the advice that, I think advice that resonates no matter what the profession is, is keep going. Um, and that is, you know, whether it's you want to work in, you want to be an author or an actor or comedian, or you want to work in finance, um, but it's to keep going and find your community. Um, I think especially in the last nine months, what community is and what it means, I think for some of us has just evolved in so many different ways. Um, but find those people who will help you to keep going even when it's hard. I know for writing, that's been huge for me. The people who even today, when I was just at this peak of joy and high and a little bit of champagne um, about it being such an awesome day, I could still go to those people and I knew they would lift me up 
um, if I was questioning anything. And I've had that in my academic career when I questioned, is this PhD worth it? Like, is my writing any good? Does my research matter? Those people who will mirror back to you and say yes, and, and then push you forward. And I, I think that's so huge no matter what the profession is, but find your people and then keep going and figure out how you keep going. Um, Anne has asked, um, first she says, congrats on your launch day. You woke up to Jody Picot tweeting you. What has been the highlight of today specifically or the debut experience in general? Um, that was pretty cool this morning. Um, <laughs> I would actually say the highlight of my day, uh, my best friend who I haven't gotten to see a lot, um, we both masked up and she went on a bookstore run with me so we could see the book in stores. Um, and when she came to the door, I answered and my husband kind of laughed, he was standing behind me and we both just like screamed at each other. <laughs> and I, you couldn't even understand what we were saying because we were both like ah! um, on either side of the door. And that was such a cool moment because when I talk about finding your people, like she is my people. Um, she, I call her my sister, my son calls her aunt. We were roommates in college. Um, and so like that is somebody who's always supportive of me. And so getting to spend a few hours with her today was just, you know, amazing and fun and just kind of reminded me I can get outside of kind of the writer bubble and still find that support too. Um, and so that was a lot of fun. Of the debut experience, I don't know if I will ever get tired of people saying they love my book. Um, <laughs> recognition is very high on my strengths list. Um, but not only that they loved it, but like that it spoke to them in different ways or that it moved them or that it was funny. Um, and that I'm sure maybe you get used to that as an author, but as a debut, that was so amazing. I mean, people saying they hated it is less amazing, um, but it's that idea, you know, they're talking about me, so that's good. Um, so <laughs> debuting, that has been really cool. And then finding a community of other debut authors, especially in romance. Um, some of my other Berkeley debuts and some of just the other 2020 debuts, we have a whole kind of side group where we support each other. Um, and those are just some of the best people. And people I could commiserate with and celebrate with, especially some of the other authors of color. And so that has been cool too. Yes, for one thing, I gave you like seven, um, but that, that was about good. The <laughs> uh, Carrie asks, what do you hope readers take away from Naya and Jake's story? Um, for me, the thing I most hope people take away is that when you feel like you are broken, you still deserve a happily ever after. Um, and for me, and I hope I showed this well, I hope I did service to survivors stories. Um, Naya feels broken and in some ways is, is broken in that trauma has really affected her and she hasn't maybe sought the help to try to feel put back together or to, to heal. Um, and so she's dealing with trauma and dealing with healing and figuring out what that looks like and she finds love and has good friends and has good sex. Um, and to show that you can contain multitudes, that those things can exist at the same time. Um, but the trauma doesn't go away because you fell in love or had good sex. Like the penis is not an organ that does that. Um, and so nor does, um, you know, love doesn't fix the, the trauma, but the trauma doesn't stop you from having love. And so for Naya, the thing that's, I think the best thing about her happily ever after is she finds somebody who supports her doing the work she needs to do to feel good. And as she puts it, kind of find the pieces of herself. Um, I love that you said that the trauma doesn't stop you from finding love. And I think that's really important. And I, I saw that uh, in Naya's story. So I think you captured that very well. Um, <laughs> Sharon asks, what's a favorite book or author you return to to reread when the creative well runs dry? Um, I think I could read Kennedy Ryan's books any day, any time um, behind my, on my shelf behind me. I have a bunch of them, but I love how she writes and how she crafts characters. And every time I read it, I'm inspired. I'm also like, I'm never going to write this well, uh, but it's okay because it's so good. Um, and how she shows different stories and different types of people and different experiences. Um, that's an author that I can always go back to. And the first time I met her, I told her in advance, like, I'm probably going to cry a little bit and fangirl. And she kind of laughed at me. And then she hugged me before I had a chance to cry and fangirl. Um, and so she's just somebody I really admire. And her writing is just beautiful. And then um, Christina Lauren uh, writes books that for me are, are fun and sexy and just sort of magical and beautiful and romantic. And I can, there's a few specifically, I can always go back to, to those books to kind of put myself back in that romance state of mind. 
Uh, Cassandra asks, which character was the easiest to write and who do you relate the most to? Um, I thought that Jake was the easiest to write. Um, but then everybody who read him told me he was too perfect. So I had to rough him up and that was kind of hard. Um, but Naya is probably the voice that I relate to the most. Um, I talked really about accidentally sending my parents the sex scenes. Um, my dad actually didn't read them because he couldn't get past like the first or second page. And he said, you know, this woman's voice, I don't know if I like it. I, I, I think she's too harsh on the student. <laughs> I was like, you know, that's my voice, right? Like That's what I would say. Um, and we laughed about that. but. You know, just her, the insecurities that come up for her and her humor, uh, I relate to a lot of those, those things in her. Um, but yeah, Jake was probably the easiest to write because I just thought about, you know, what would Prince Eric do? And then I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and from um, Cherish, we have, based on your varied reading interests, do you think you'll want to write in a genre outside of rom-com or contemporary romance? I don't think so. I mean, if I uh, if I decide to pull out uh, the strangers downstairs or upstairs, whatever it's called, uh, that would be a little bit different. But I like reading in other genres, but I always find myself missing the kissing. Um, and so <laughs> I think love stories for me are, at least right now, where I see myself kind of staying. And there's so much variance in romance, whether it's uh, a light kind of fluffy, fun rom-com, or it's something with kind of more serious social issues, or it's me paranormal, or, or even horror and some of those things. I think that romance can go a lot of ways. So I don't know if I see myself writing outside of romance, at least anytime soon. And from uh, Shamira or Shamira, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, what's the most difficult thing about writing characters from the opposite sex? Um, I think there's, I think there's a lot of things um, that can be hard writing somebody whose gender is different from your own, um, just in the way that you're getting in somebody else's head and even thinking through kind of how they see the, the world. I remember I was having a conversation with my husband about um, walking at night and like how I hold my keys and the, like these kind of different things. And he's like, huh, I've never thought about that. And that for me is just one of those examples that I'm like, huh, we see the world very differently and how we move through it. Um, so like, Thinking through that, um, this book is single point of view, so we're never in Jake's head. Um, so it's kind of seeing his motives from externally. I think the other thing that for me is challenging in my next book has dual point of view, um, is writing a uh, sex scene from, the, from another gender uh, because it's thinking about what sensations would feel like that you don't have. Like there are, there are pieces that I don't have. And so thinking about like how, what it would feel like or how would some, in somebody's head, what would they think about being touched here, this act or whatever. And so I think reading helps with that. But I also ask my husband a lot of questions and he's like, why are you asking me this? <laughs> it's like, it's for research, it's for work. Don't worry about it. Um, so that I think is, is a bit of a challenge and I think other authors do it really well. So I try to go read their work. Oh, great. Um, I love that. I was gonna ask, do you ask your husband, like, what are, what are you thinking at this moment? <laughs> He's just learned not to question. He just goes with it. <laughs> um, so we're going to close out, but I wanted to ask you uh, to rate how to fail at flirting when it comes to spice level. Okay, mm. on a scale of one to 10, with one being, you know, very sweet and chaste and there's no, no humping. It's just, it's just, you know, maybe a kid. Yeah. <laughs> and 10 being, oh my God, this should be on Pornhub. <laughs> Where would you rate how to fail at flirting? I would probably put it at, I would say for a romance reader, an avid romance reader, I'd probably put it at a six, six and a half. Um, and for a non-romance reader, I'd probably put it at an eight, eight and a half. Okay. I, I would say, I would say you're at a seven for like, in my opinion, as somebody who like reads romances all the uh -huh. time, I thought it was pretty, I thought it was pretty solid. I, I think you're selling yourself a little short there. <laughs> I mean, they get in there, <laughs> which I don't know if I realized fully until I started listening to the audiobook and was hearing January Lavoie read them back to me. And I was like, oh my, who wrote this? 